Dr. Barron is on the MGA's Medical Advisory Committee and a past recipient of the Stackhouse Award. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Barron. Thank you. Well, thanks, and it's great to be here and invited to give the, this year's annual uh, lecture. Uh, this is an amazing group, and it just keeps growing and getting better. I'm always impressed by how organized uh, this group is. And, you know, I can, I've been here for 15 years, and it was smaller then. <laughs> and it's just been a pleasure to see this group grow and be successful. Um, and I just want to give a, I, I would, want to thank everyone in the organization, but particularly I uh, want to call out Ann Strader. Um, where, is she hiding back there again? She's working as usual. Yeah. I mean, I, so Ann is amazing. And, you know, she's there. We have MG Clinic every Tuesday. And she's there for the clinics. And she is uh, part of our clinic team. And, and when Ann's not there, come on over. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I have like five MG pictures on the schedule, and if Ann's not there, I start to panic. And I start tell, asking Judy, our, our MG nurse, Judy Ray right here, um, where's Ann, you know? And so uh, I, we almost can't run the clinic without her. She's become indispensable. And, you know, we admit, you know, one or two MG patients a month, it seems. And, um, and we always tell Ann, and that's with those eight hospital visits, she's always willing to go over to the hospital and meet the, uh, see the patients and families in the hospital. So anyway, just thank you, Ann, for everything you do. It's just amazing. And um, then also on our clinic team who's here today is uh, Judy Ray, who's our nurse, and Amatha Pastor, who's one of the doctors on our team. And when I got here in 2001, it was just me and Dr. McVeigh. She came a couple months after me, and now we've grown and, uh, to having, I don't know how many names he ran off, six or seven uh, MG specialists, which is pretty amazing. And I, um, so I think we do have, you know, a large MG clinic. Um, I don't know if it's the largest in the country, but it's pretty big. And, um, and in addition, uh, we're really one of the MG research, clinical research centers in the United States now, and that's grown over the last 10 years. Um, and we're basically almost in every MG clinical research study that comes along, and I'm going to talk about those here in just a minute. So uh, we're very fortunate in this community to have both the MG Association and um, the MG Clinic here and all of its members to, to help our patients and their families. So I guess the pointer is here. Let's see. Yeah. So let me run through some information about MG, and then I know you all are going to have a number of questions that myself and Dr. Pasnor, I hope Mike Schwartzman comes. Oh, good. All right, great. And um, and then and maybe Judy can help on those too, um, uh, from a nurse's perspective. Um, but let me go through some basic information, and and a lot of this is colored with my perspective about MG. Not all of it's right. Um, the numbers are a little hard to argue with, so I suppose those are right. Um, it, even though there's uh, 25,000 cases in the U.S., uh, that is considered a rare disease by the, def by the there's definitions of what a rare disease is, uh, uh, it, and uh, that and MG qualifies as being a rare disease. And it can occur at any age, but as a general rule, Older patients tend to be men, younger patients tend to be women, but that is just statistics. I mean, we see there's exceptions to that all the time. And we, uh, the kids get MG. Um, most of the kids with MG are seen over at Children's Mercy, but we see a few at KU, and they send them over to me or, my, or our team for second opinions and to help them follow them um, since we have a little more experience. Um, so it, it really can affect any age. And the symptoms you all are aware of, because more than half of you in the audience have MG, uh, and it, it's either eye symptoms, chewing, swallowing symptoms, or weakness. Uh, if you read the textbooks, they say that all the symptoms are worse later in the day. And um, I mean, it seems like everything is worse later in the day, though. <laughs> so I don't know where that came from. And maybe you all experienced that, but. Uh, it, most of the MG patients, when I talk to them in clinic, they say, well, they can be weak in the morning, too. So I, I don't know how helpful that is, um, but that's what, that's what the books say. 
And uh, Medji often begins in the eyes with droopy eyes or double vision. Um, but uh, the patients that were, where it does begin in the eyes, um, uh, many of them go on to generalize to chewing, swallowing, and limb muscles. And I was talking to one of the patients as we were walking in to the clinic. To, uh, what's your name? Hi. So uh, he was lost, and I helped him find the entrance to the building. So, <laughs> um, so uh, we were talking about progression of ocular MG, and, and it is true that um, if you have ocular MG and you don't progress after the first year or two, you're probably in the clear and it's probably gonna stay ocular, but it's not always, and we've seen exceptions to that, but you know, most of the time that, that's the case, and we can talk about that a little more if you want. So most patients generalize within the first three years, and the good news about myasthenia gravis is that it's not that grave anymore. I mean, it's never a good thing to have a disease, but the mortality rate used to be 30% or more um, uh, before 1960, and now it's, it's low. People usually do not die from myasthenia gravis unless there's major complications in the hospital. Um, so uh, why is that? And uh, we're going to talk about the therapies for MG. You know, I think it's mainly due to mechanical ventilation and prednisone, but uh, we could discuss other things that may also play a role in that and the drugs that probably work in MG. So this is the only slide I was going to talk about thymoma. Uh, and, uh, and chest CTs for MG, but it, it's 15% uh, of patients about with new onset MG, if you do a chest CT, will have an enlargement of this thymus gland, which is an immune gland um, that is usually inactive in adults. Um, it's only really active in childhood, and they can have a tumor of this immune gland called a thymoma. And so uh, there's clearly a relationship between thymomas and MG. And so if you, that's why we get a chest CT, is to see if there's a thymoma. And if there is a thymoma, then the, the surgeon has to take it out. We'll talk about thymectomy at the end. Um, but we, we, uh, we don't do a chest CT just to see if the thymus is enlarged, uh, 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 and not, a, not thymoma, but just enlarged uh, as, a, as a sign of whether or not you should take it out. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll get to should you do a thymectomy or not, but if you have a thymoma, you have to have a thymectomy. If you don't have a thymoma, it's debatable, and, and so we can talk about that. Um, so, uh, and, and uh, even if you take the thymoma out, that doesn't mean the MG is going to get better. Once the, th once the immune response has been triggered to cause MG, it often doesn't make any difference if you take out the thymoma, and we still have to treat the MG for years. So this is the only slide I was going to talk about diagnosis uh, of MG, uh, but, uh, and, and I was going to spend most of the talk about treatment, um, but these are the tests that we use to diagnose MG. Um, we don't do the edrophonium test or tensilon test much very, uh, very often. How many myasthenia patients in the room had a tensilon test? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. About ten, maybe eight or nine or ten, so uh, but but it's really not that common anymore to do, and we rely on the other things. Um, I think Judy in Mamatha, I'm the only one left that still does tensilon tests in the clinic because I'm old, I guess. <laughs> and um, but well, I'll do it one, a few times a year. I'll do a tensilon test, and someone's got droopy eyes to see if it opens up. But usually you can make the diagnosis without the tensilon test. And if you're not used to doing a tensilon test frequently, it's often a three-ring circus getting the clinic or the hospital set up to do it. And so uh, um, it's, it, it's usually not that necessary. Most, most of the time, diagnosis is made on antibiotics um, at a blood test, which is good. Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes you do the electrical test, repetitive stim and single fiber EMG, which I'm sure if you have, you don't like them. And so, because um, they do hurt to do this nerve stimulation to see if you have this fatigable response. Um, but they're useful in certain settings. And so we still use them. But the most uh, useful test is the antibodies. And I, this is the, really the only science slide I have up here. And uh, I, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it does, it, well, 
uh, it does raise the, uh, the point that we have only known that Mycena gravis is an immune disease really since 1973, which is not that long ago. So here I started medical school at UMKC. Um, but uh, before that, no one, knew what, no one knew what caused myasthenia. Um, there was this Dr. Simpson in 1960 who speculated it might be autoimmune, but it wasn't until the discoveries in 1973 and 1974 where these antibodies were found in the blood, the, ast the antibodies, the acetylcholine receptor, that myasthenia gravis was proven to be an autoimmune disease where your immune system goes haywire and starts making antibodies against the muscle. So that's really when this all um, first began. Um, and the next big breakthrough really was in 2002 when Dr. Lennon at Mayo Clinic discovered a second antibody, which is positive in some MG patients called Musk, um, and, uh, and, and that, uh, the, that's positive in some patients who don't have the estoclone receptor antibody. And then in the last couple of years, there was another antibody discovered called L LRP, is that, and, and, but that's not commercially available yet. And actually there's even, even one or two more that have been discovered in the last couple of years. So folks that are antibody negative, there is an antibody there, it just hadn't been discovered yet, um, if they really have MG. Um, and so uh, there have been some more recent breakthroughs to find those antibodies in the folks where they do not have the antibody acetylcholine receptor. And this is just the cartoon of the, let's see which one's the, 